Good morning. Good morning. This is, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say first, it's a beautiful morning in the city of Flagstaff, Arizona. <laughs> Chilly, and the sun just came up in the last five minutes. And good morning, Allison. And it's chilly, Flagstaff, with the winter storm warning coming in. We left Green Valley yesterday on our way to ministry assignment in Nevada, in Las Vegas, and connecting with our constituents there for a week, and uh, hopefully outrunning this storm storm that's coming across the country and this is the western tail of it and I this morning I thought did y'all even want to hear this this, <laughs> this morning I, I my mind wandered back to when we unpacked in Green Valley in July record breaking heat <laughs> desert cactus all that and I'm, we're unpacking, and I'm cleaning out the vehicles, and I pull out our scrapers. And I thought, well, we won't need these anymore, and we put them in the dumpster. <laughs> it didn't occur to me that in sight of where we live, you could see snow on the mountains. You can tell he was relieved to be out of the cold weather territory <laughs> in Missouri. You can tell. But this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, yes. where we have for six years... Uh, gotten our whole Bible back, and when we're done getting it back in Revelations, we're going to begin again because we always will learn s something new in the Word, and I always look forward to the Word of God being taught on Morning Light. It's uh, brought me a long way. And it's such a a blessing to now, after that length of time, to be in the Gospels mm -hmm. because after the Old Testament, the Gospels are the most, some of the most neglected portions of Scripture. Most commonly, uh, ministers spend all their time in the Pauline epistles, the epistles of Paul the Apostle, in the pastoral epistles, Peter, James, etc. Uh, and I think that's a, to the great detriment of the believer. And so, in bringing the Gospel of Matthew to you and the remaining Gospels that we'll be going through, my, my hope is that something of the original intent of the Father in bringing this narrative down to us will soak into our thinking mm -hmm. that uh, uh, in the midst, you know, everything you teach comes through a filter. And I was praying this morning, God, I don't want my my opinions, my own personal filter to, to redact anything of the gospel of Matthew that you want the people to receive and to soak in uh, because this is as close as we come at sitting at the master's feet Amen. and learning of him. And we're in Matthew 21 today challenging the status quo in Chapter 21 of Matthew, Jesus upsets the tables of the money changers and insults the elders and leaders in Jerusalem. If such a disruptive element stirred things up at your church this Sunday, would you be able to discern that it was God's work? Now just imagine, just picture it in your mind. I don't know how you take up the offering, but most times there's a receptacle involved and and when the offering's done being received or brought to the front a lot of times that's how it's done these days and the deacon is taking the money back to the to the counting room can you imagine some young zealot barring his way there while he's still in the front where everybody could see and he slaps the offering receptacle out of the deacon's hand and the the <laughs> money given goes flying and uh, within seconds I promise you within seconds, whoever was appointed to keep good order would be on top of that guy and giving him the bum's rush right out the door. And, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what Jesus did. It's that song by Nicole Nordeman. Uh, 
I'm trying to remember, I can't quote the lyrics, but basically she talks about all of the inappropriate things Jesus did in his lifetime. And if he was what if he's right? <laughs> in the day that we're living in, would she be able to recognize him? Would she be one of those pointing a finger of accusation or would she recognize him for who he is? And so in the events of this chapter, as it's recorded and handed down to us, there is an opportunity for us to look in our hearts and determine just where do our fidelities lie? Uh, with the living Christ? Or are we so anchored in religious culture that we wouldn't be able to discern him when he came into our midst? It's a, it's a lengthy chapter, 46 verses. If you begin, Kitty, by reading verses 1 through 22, please. Okay. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, they were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoke, spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, a foal of the of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded, and brought the ass and the colt. And it's sweet they were there, ready and waiting, and put them, um, and put them their clothes, put on them their clothes, and they set him there on. And a very great multitude spread out their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitude that went before them that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came unto him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. And he left them, and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and found nothing thereon but the leaves only, and said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall say not only to this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. So in Matthew 21, we find the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into, excuse me, the high altitudes. Got my mind not working like a bucket. <laughs> uh, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He he instructs two of his disciples to go ahead of him and that they'd find an ass tied with a young colt and that they were to return to that, those animals to Jesus. And he further instructs them that if the owner objects to their actions, they are to say, the Lord hath need of them. Now, I want you to picture this in your mind. Now, my father was in the car business as well as he was a minister as well. Used to, people used to walk up to him in the grocery line, and they would say, excuse me, sir, waiting to pay for groceries. lady would touch him on the shoulder. He said, excuse me, sir, are you a minister? And 
He'd give him a big toothy grin. He'd say, no, I'm a used car dealer. Dear dad. <laughs> and both were true. <laughs> <laughs> but and because of that, I, I had some intimate familiarity with the car business. And so there's always a little place under lock and key where all the car keys are kept. Well, can you imagine in the local car dealership, a young uh, minister walks in without saying a word, goes behind the counter, flips mm-hmm. open that little that little panel, reaches up, grabs the keys, and then now back then, an ass with a young colt, we're talking about premium transportation, so right. he doesn't get the Ford Focus, okay? He <laughs> gets the Cadillac Escalade. And the car dealer says, what are you doing? He says, well, the master has need of him. So uh, what I ask you is, is part of being discipled by Christ and learning how to do grand theft auto is, is this what do you see how unusual uh, this is and you know the passage doesn't give a lot of details on how that took place I would love this one story I would really enjoy to know more about when we get to heaven and it's one of those instances of humor in the gospels if you're paying attention the other one is when uh the mother of uh, James and John uh, Mm -hmm. says, let my son sit on thy right hand. And Jesus said, it's not mine to give. Well, if you're reading between the lines, he's basically saying now, mama, you know, if it was up to me, (laughs) that's exactly what I'd be doing. But, you know, he, he more or less threw the father under the bus is what he did. Mm -hmm. And so (laughs) this situation is there's, there's just humor there that can be appreciated. Uh, but it's a fulfillment. Jesus coming in on the foal of an ass was a well-known metaphor. The iconography of this picture was known to the people in that day that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem. He was making a statement that was not lost on the people because Zechariah 9.9 says that the Messiah would come lowly riding upon an ass, upon a colt in the foal of an ass. And so again, we see that Matthew is addressing the Jewish nation as his intended audience, as this would have little meaning to an uninformed Gentile. Gentiles reading this wouldn't understand because Matthew's writing to the initiated. He's writing to those who would understand uh, what he was getting at. And this picture was evocative of the messianic hopes of the people. Uh, upon seeing this itinerant miracle worker entering Jerusalem in this manner, and they're laying their garments along the way and palm fronds as an expression of worship and honor. Of course, for us, it's there's an irony there because we realize in just a few days this same crowd would cry, crucify him, crucify mm-hmm. him, his blood be upon our heads and upon the heads of our children. And when Jesus arrives near the temple, he he leaves this scene of adulation and he assaults the money changers, overthrowing their booths and tables with an accusation that they have made his father's house of prayer into a den of thieves. And before any of the officials have time to react, he immediately turns and begins healing the blind and the lame instantly. It's like without, without a break in his actions. Uh, and so you see this tremendous tumult and, and it's, it's drawing the attention of the elders, the scribes, the chief priests, the Pharisees. Uh, if you want to find Jesus in your city, look for the place where business as usual has been interrupted by the zeal of the Lord <laughs> upon his servants. That is where the miracle working power is present to heal and to deliver. Uh, and, you know, it's like uh, I remember visiting a church in Sulphur, Louisiana when I lived there. And it was a lovely church and it was an anointed church service. And the minister got up and he preached a message on those that have turned the world upside down have come here also. And he was saying, where are, that's where, where are those people that are turning the world upside down for Christ? That's the people that we want to connect with. That's the people we want to have at home in our, in our uh, services. And, of course, I was a first-time visitor, and 
on my way out the door, he was standing at the door as a pastor does, greeting everybody on the way out the door, telling them thanks for coming. And uh, he reached out, took my hand, and uh, I and he said, well, well, who are you? And I pulled him close. I said, I'm one of those that you were talking about in the service. Mm-hmm. And he could not let go. It's like taking my hand was like shaking hands with a rattlesnake. He could not let go of my hand That's quick right. enough <laughs> and couldn't get me out the door quick enough. Because unfortunately, sometimes pastors and ministers, you know, they preach stuff. And then when you go out and do what they preach, you get yourself into trouble. And so uh, not only do the sick and the maimed come out to Jesus, but the chief priests and the scribes come out. And instead of being pleased at the things that they see taking place, they're complaining about all the fuss. Uh, And they confront Jesus, not only because he overturned the tables of the money changers, but because he's not silencing the people for all the good things they're saying about, uh, about him. And Jesus answered, he says, well, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, God has perfected praise. And without another word, he turns and he leaves the temple going out of the city of Bethany. Uh, Reminds me of C.M. Ward. I don't know how many of you would know who he was, but he was the speaker uh, for the official radio broadcast of the Assemblies of God denomination for many years. And... uh, one day he made a statement on the air in a live broadcast. He, says, he said he had more anointing in his little finger than uh, the entire general uh, board of the Assemblies of God at uh, 2121 Boonville Avenue, Springfield, Missouri. Wow. <laughs> and, of course, he was a very, uh, he had a tremendous sense of humor, and he was quite a character. And They called him to headquarters and, they asked him to come down. They stood him up in front of the superintendent's desk, and they said, you can't say things like that. What what prompted you to say such a thing? And he just smiled. He said, well, it's amazing what you'll say under the anointing. <laughs> My goodness. And so Jesus goes out to Bethany, and in verse 18, he gets up after a good night's sleep, and he's hungry. So he goes to a nearby fig tree for breakfast. And he's dismayed that there are no figs on the branches. And he straightway curses the fig tree. Another gospel tells us it wasn't time to have figs on this tree. And that's another conversation. But he says, let no fruit grow on you henceforward and forever. And immediately the tree shows evidence of withering away to the marvel of the disciples looking on. After questioning Jesus about this, look at the, the, the blanket faith statements he makes. He said, if you had faith without doubt, you could not only do what's been done to the fig tree by your words, but could veritably move an actual mountain and cast it into the sea. What an astounding statement. And one that really doesn't get the treatment it deserves when it's taught in our pulpits. <coughs> Usually when this gets taught, it's surrounded by, excuse me, I got a little bit of a head cold. It's surrounded by uh, a lot of caveats and exceptions. Only if it's something God wants you to have. And, and only if it's something for someone else. It can't be anything for you personally and and only if it's to the furtherance of the gospel and to see souls saved. In other words, they're, they're, they're uncomfortable with the blanket faith statements that Jesus makes. But let's remember who he's talking to. These men have not yet received the Holy Ghost. They were technically not even born again yet. Yet Jesus is saying that they have within themselves, even as unregenerate men, in the interim state of being followers of Jesus before salvation was paid for at the cross, <coughs> pardon me, yet Jesus emphatically states that they have far more power in their words and authority in the earth than they could ever conceive. And you have to ask yourself, do you actually believe this? You know, we teach that you can get your 
You can do things by faith after you come to Christ. Jesus was speaking to his followers who did not yet have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He had not yet breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They were not in a born-again state. They were technically still under the old covenant. And he's saying that you have this great power in your words. And people say, well, he's speaking metaphorically. No, he wasn't. Mm -hmm. Because he was speaking quite literally. What you have literally seen happen to this fig tree, you could literally see happen to an actual mountain do you see? Oh, and and they teach against this. No, don't have faith in your faith. I got emails on that one. We put a word out recently about having faith in your faith. They say, oh, that doesn't sound right to me. And somebody wrote me a letter and said, Kenneth E. Hagen Sr. wrote a book called Have Faith in Your Faith and took it off the market and has refused. The, his organization doesn't reprint it because they feel like it was an error, apparently. And But if our faith originated from God, because he's given to every man the measure of faith. Are you saying we can't trust what he's given us? We better. The word faith means confidence. If somebody gives me something, my wife uh, gave me a Mercedes for my birthday two years ago. And guess what? I drove it. I'm driving it still. I, have, I had confidence. I took those keys, I got in it, and I've used it ever since. I appreciate what she did for me. I have faith. I have confidence. I didn't think she would go get me something, but before she brought it to me, I don't think she pulled it over to the side, loosened up the brake lines, Mm -hmm. uh, did something to make it going to blow up whenever Mm -hmm. I get into it. I have faith in what she gave me. Mm -hmm. So faith, God's given to every man the measure of faith, and if it came from God, every good gift and every perfect gift come down from the Father of lights. If he gave you your faith, then... It would be wrong. It would be an offense against God if you did not have faith in your faith. And Jesus is telling these men, if you had faith, you would say to the fig tree, "Be no man eat fruit of you forever. You would say to the mountain, be removed. What are you saying to your mountain? What are you saying to those things in your life that are not bearing fruit? There is much, far more power. For Jesus, if Jesus had not said this, and for it to be taught today, it would be accused of being uh, a spiritualist, being accused of New Age teaching, uh, and so on and so forth. And in fact, it is what Jesus taught. Mm -hmm. And except for the fact that Jesus did say it, you would have a lot more... You see, there is more time taken up in the pulpits of the Western world denouncing these blanket faith statements of Jesus than in encouraging people to step out faith believing. Say, well, I know somebody did that. It didn't work. Well, the Bible says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. I'll never forget, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, I'll never forget my oldest son. He was three years old, had a raging fever. Uh, We lived across the street from the emergency room, and I instructed that my boy would be taken to the church six blocks away because there was a prayer meeting going on, and I knew those ladies knew how to get a hold of God. And so uh, my little boy was taken up uh, to the prayer meeting and guess what he was instantly healed but I got an instruction and God bless her it was from my own mother she says Russ it's one thing to believe God for yourself but you can't take chances with children bless her heart (laughs) and I you know uh, I respected my mother loved my mother she was I've never known a woman of deeper piety in my lifetime but I knew something was wrong with that. And then I was working for a minister in our church. He was a contractor, and we were putting a roof down in a house, and he overheard the story about what had happened. He chewed me out. He started talking about, now I don't remember all the names, but he mentioned 
names like Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts, household names. And in each one, he said, that one has a disabled child. And that one had a daughter that died of such and such a disease. And that one has a, a child mentally disabled. He, and he said, who do you think you are? You don't have greater faith than these men. How dare you? Uh, act in such a way. Well, the problem was he had a son with type 1 diabetes that they'd believed God for getting healed and they decided God wanted the boy to have diabetes or something. And while he was going, I'm a young man. I, this guy was much older than me, experienced in the ministry. Usually I wasn't very good at giving a response. But as he was talking, I remembered that in Hebrews chapter, I believe it's chapter 12. And where after the roll call of the faithful in Hebrews 11, chapter 12 begins looking unto Jesus. And I told him, I looked at him, I said, Brother, those men are not my example. That's right. I don't care if there's not one single person on the face of the earth who has ever experienced mountain moving faith. My own mother is not my example in such things. My own father is not the example, and my own experience is not the example. When I came to Christ, I told the Lord, as an adult, when I came to Christ, I said, I don't care if I live my life for the rest of my life without any other indication that the atheist is 100% correct. I'm going to stand on your word, and I'm going to believe what your word says. And I'm going to expect for what Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do. And you hear people who claim to believe in the fullness of God that will pick that statement apart as though that isn't what Jesus meant. And we need not to allow our minds to be contaminated. We need to take these blanket faith statements. And even this morning at 2 o'clock in the morning when I was studying this verse, I made a renewed commitment within myself to believe God to have what Jesus Jesus, in teaching it, he was appalled that these men didn't get it. Mm -hmm. I want to have what Jesus presumptively expected his disciples to perceive and understand was their portion Mm -hmm. in following after him. How about you? I know you feel that way. I know something burns in our hearts. We want what Jesus paid for, don't we? Mm -hmm. Verse 23 through the end of the chapter. And thank you, Tiffany. We are in agreement with that prayer. Uh, Verse 23, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Who gave you your papers? (laughs) I'm not AKC registered. I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Verse 24, And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask you one thing. And always answer a question with a question. Which, if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, Well, if we shall say from heaven, he'll say to us, Why did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. They didn't really want to know. But what, sorry, I don't usually add all those things, but I love the New Testament. Um, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Go, son, go to uh, today into my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I will go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him, The first, Jesus say unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and harlots believed him, and ye, when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it around and digged in, digged wine press, digged a wine press in it and built a tower, and let it go out to the husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed the other, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did it unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto him his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. 
Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits of their season. Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected, the, st- the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whom it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Yeah, they didn't know. They didn't understand the parable, but they said, whatever he's saying, we know it doesn't make us look very good. So having made these bold and authoritative faith statements, and after making this disruption in the temple, the chief priests and the elders come again to Jesus, and they demand to know upon what authority Jesus is creating all this hubbub. It's like, what's all the hubbub, bub? (laughs) In their perfectly ordered temple life, Jesus in classic form answers their questions with a question regarding the ministry of John the Baptist. I was many years, I learned to answer questions with questions when I was in my 20s, but I was in my 40s before I ever actually got it done. Because I just couldn't help but just wade into some argument with somebody who didn't see things the way I did. And uh, so the elders have no intention of sanctioning John's ministry with their reply because John endorsed Jesus. So they don't want to denounce John, neither do they want to endorse John. So here's the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination and their posture on tongues. Seek not, forbid not. Or the charismatic renewal on the West Coast that said uh, Calvary Temple. We don't want to stop all that signs and wonders, but let's take that to the afterglow room Mm -hmm. and not let it mess up our perfectly good and well-ordered little service. We don't want to run off those that don't speak in tongues. So we'll take all that and we'll push that back into the prayer room, into the afterglow service. And so the disciples, the Pharisees rather, they just plead ignorance. And upon their response, he said, well, if you can't answer that question about John the Baptist, neither will I tell you by what authority that I do those things. It's like Kitty and I. There are things that people will come and ask us certain questions and they get just a little too personal. And we say, well, I'm sorry, I don't have permission to talk about that. And uh, so learn to be wise as serpents yet gentle as doves. Learn to answer questions with questions. Or there have been times when people have just outright tried to create a public scorn. I'm talking about in meetings. And uh, the Lord taught Kitty and I, and we were confronted one time in Nashville uh, in a meeting, and uh, there was a person there who thought he was the... uh, the head honcho when it came to all things spiritual and he didn't like the fact that his friends were listening to anybody but him and so he just openly insulted us and and I held Kitty's hand and I looked at him with as sincere a response as I could give I said do you know what you've done for us brother I just and I, I, put, I touched him on his shoulder I said I just can't tell you how much I appreciate this thank you so much And he got befuddled, and he's like, well, that was not the response he was looking for. And he turned, and he walked away, because it didn't go the way he wanted it to go. And then I leaned over and whispered to my wife. I said, because I didn't appreciate it at all, but I'm not about to let him know that. Did you hear that wind just now? It sounded like the Holy (laughs) Ghost coming into the room. (laughs) It's really breezy outside. So learn. Realize that we live in an adversarial world world 
<laughs> that cares little for the things that you and I hold dear. And that doesn't mean we run from them. That's right. Let's, I got, we received a prophetic word years ago that God would always, always move us to the other side of the chess table and put us in enemy territory. And so we've learned when we have opposition, our default response is we're going to do whatever we have to do to get right in the heart of the opposition. Mm-hmm. Go to their meetings, go to their councils, get right up in the middle of their circumstance and situation, not to pick a fight, Mm -hmm. just to present ourselves there without any thought of what we're going to say. But our posture is this. Whatever they might think, they're going to know that the last time they saw us, we were moving toward them in love. Amen. That's the key to remember. And isn't that what Jesus did? See, uh, people are going to be little convinced by the things that move us in our hearts. But know this, you know, Jesus said, even if one rose from the dead, they're not going to be convinced. Mm. And to be sure, God will draw those to him that he will, but it's not our responsibility to be apologetic, Mm -hmm. to be convincing of others regarding the veracity or the desirability of our faith that we hold dear. Learn at times to let your tongue cleave to the roof of your mouth Amen. and refuse to stand with your head in your hand when others mock and deride. Kitty and I do a lot of ministry out in public. And when we're walking in a public venue or we're in a restaurant, I'm going to talk to the people at my table just like others nearby are talking about the football game or whatever's mm-hmm. going on. Amen. I'll never forget in the midst of that a man that we were we were evangelizing in a full restaurant. And, and I wasn't raising my voice any louder. Kitty can witness. Mm-hmm. I wasn't trying to get anybody's attention. But I was just taking my liberty. I'm in a public place. I'm paying the bill. I, get her, I don't have to whisper. And in the midst of it, the man was very receptive. But then he thought about a dear friend of his who was dying of cancer. And he and without a word, he took out his phone, he called his friend, and he asked me if I would pray for his friend. Now, what am I going to do? <laughs> and so I bowed my head, and I took the phone, and I prayed the prayer. I've seen cancers healed. I've seen Amen. the dead raised. Amen. I have absolute faith in God. I'm, I am unafraid of deathbed diagnoses. And I prayed for that gentleman, and amazingly, the Spirit of God fell in that entire restaurant, and everybody put their utensils down, put their hands in their laps, and bowed their heads as I prayed for that man. It was powerful. And the Spirit of God made himself known. And the other day we were in a restaurant. We were just minding our business, talking about the things of God. And our little waitress, she just (laughs) decided she was going to inject herself into that conversation. And it was like like the, the conversation with the woman at the well who wanted to have a theological debate with Jesus. And she heard just enough of our conversation. She was picking every point she could to have a theological debate (laughs) with us about how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. We just tried to keep loving her while we continued to minister to the person at the table in Uh front of us. You don't get the tuck head Uh -uh. just because you're in a public place. You're not trying to get everybody to listen. It's like my dad, as a young pastor, he had a buddy called Red, named Red Weems. And Red was a rough old boy and he, his idea of evangelism is he would wrestle somebody to the ground uh, and uh, hold them down until they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And if you'd take him out to a cafe, he would stand up on top of his chair, command everybody in the restaurant to come to attention and bow their heads, and his praying over the food would be a salvation message for all them sinners to get saved. Now, my dad would look at him and said, Red, I don't think that's how we're supposed to do that. <laughs> So then Jesus tells these temple officials a parable concerning his two sons. Concerning two sons. The father instructs one to go to his vineyard, and the first son refuses, but afterward he repents and goes away. The second son says, of course I'm going to go, but afterward he does not. Jesus asks the elders which of them did the will of his father. And they say, well, the first one who said he wasn't going to go but afterward obeyed. And then Jesus tersely answered. He said, that's correct. And for this reason, the publicans and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom ahead of them, ahead of the initiated. 
ahead of those that thought they had the title deed to all spiritual understanding. I believe this is exactly how Jesus would talk to evangelicals, full gospel, charismatic, Pentecostal, prophetic people today. Because we have a general sense and understanding that we are the initiated. We have to understand when we're the friend, I, I pray that the deepest criticism that it could ever be leveled about against Kitty and I is that we're the friends of publicans and prostitutes. Amen. That, that when I, if I live long enough to go by way of the grave, let that be my epitaph on my tombstone. He was the friend of publicans and sinners. And publicans and sinners felt comfortable in my presence and Amen. wanted to hang out with me. Amen. And so, uh, you know, while the elders in Jerusalem knew who he was and received him not, but uh, before they can react, Jesus tells another parable of a householder who carefully planted a vineyard, led it out to husbandmen. He tried to receive the fruits of it, and they killed and beat his servants. And then he sends his son, and they killed his son, hoping to take over ownership of the vineyard. You know, sometimes we assert ownership. I've had people tell me that. We'd open the doors is to let God just bring in whoever he wanted into the church and the people that were in the church when we came. They would meet with us. They have a committee, meet with us behind closed doors and said, you have ruined our church. <laughs> well, here's the problem. It's, it's not their church. Amen. One of the things that destroys a church and splits a church is when you have an influx of people and all of a sudden those who thought it was their church don't recognize it anymore because it's being filled up with people they consider inappropriate for the venue. And so the implications are plain. The elders in Jerusalem, the temple leaders, they would rather kill the very Son of God than relinquish their status, control of the city, and the people to their rightful Messiah. And thereupon they have this murderous rage, but they know better than to touch Jesus for fear that the people would rend them in pieces because the population venerated him. So what about us? What would be what would we do if some rogue element in our church culture upset the status quo? So if it said, excuse me, we need to stop all this. Would you stop put on those instruments? Would y'all just come off that platform? We're gonna stop doing this right now. It's time to do something different. That's the kind of disruption Jesus was bringing. Would we side with those who would reject such a tumult? Or would we have the discernment to read the situation and realize that God was doing something we should pay attention to? However, whether our leaders or our mentors complained and rejected it. In the events of this chapter, you realize Jesus is laying the groundwork for the very decompiling of the Jewish religious system and the establishing of something completely different that would emerge as Christianity as we know it. What if God today, what if God, what if the heart of God, looking out of events today, the same way he looked out of the prevailing religious system in, in that day, what if when he looked out of Judaism, he realized Judaism would be thrown aside Jewish culture and a wild olive branch grafted in. What if God's plan is to take Christianity as we know it and tear it out of the vine and cast it aside as Judaism was? Paul spoke about this in Romans 11. You can go read it. And he's going to graft something in that's going to be so far removed from what we know of in our prevailing religious system that like the Jews, they very quickly made the uh, conclusion that these people were not Jewish anymore. That what they, by which way they called heresy, those new followers of the way were worshiping the God that the Jews claimed they cornered the market on. What if there was something so far removed would we be capable? And again, it goes to the question that God asked me a long time ago. He said, I was studying, I was just minding my own business, a good little pastor of a rural church, getting ready for Wednesday night prayer meeting. Of course, we didn't pray, but we called it a prayer meeting. And the Lord just spoke to me, says, do you know what you are? And I put my 
put my computer away. I sat back in my chair and I said out loud, no, but I think you're going to tell me. And he took me to Acts where it said many priests were obedient to the faith. The priesthood in the Jewish culture that crucified Jesus were the most privileged class of people. They were born to privilege. They never had to think about where their uh, resources would come from. They were taken care of the rest of their life. Their children, their children's 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 would be taken care of. They were privileged beyond all imagining. But yet it said many priests were obedient to the faith. They gave up unimaginable privilege to follow after Jesus. And he took me to Hebrews where Hebrews was written to help Jews coming out of Judaism into the new faith. He said, let us go out to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. And the Lord said to me, are you willing to go out? Are you willing to go all the way out if necessary to follow me, to truly have who I am and what I'm prepared to be to this generation to the point that they don't even consider you a Christian anymore. They're going to think you're something else. And I thought about it and I said, yes, yes, Lord. I'm like, like Peter, I'll follow you wherever you go. Mm-hmm. And the Lord said, we'll test to that theory. Yeah. And, you know, we haven't fully experienced that, but Kitty and I have largely experienced that in the birth of Father's Heart Ministry. There was a point when not one person, not one, my father and one other person stood with us in the birth of Father's Heart Ministry. But even as rough as that was, and to this day we were praying this morning about estrangement from some of our children who don't accept what God has done in our lives. But yet I know even as rough as that's been, I don't know that we've plumbed the depths of what God said to me that day. So how about you? Are you willing to relinquish Christianity for Christ? You know, you'd say, well, that's a little radical. Well, Billy Graham himself, when he went to China, he was asked at a state dinner, Mm -hmm. if he, through an interpreter, do you believe in the Christ of Christianity? He said, no, I believe in the Christ of the Bible. Amen. And so it's like John Wimber said many times, he says, God is asking us, to surrender church as we know it for church as he wants it. And I dare say, if you look honestly at church culture as we know it, we far so fall so far beneath surely what Jesus died to bring about. You get a lot of argument about that from those that maintain the status quo and whose livelihoods are anchored in the status quo. But if we have any intellectual honesty at all, we have to say, God Please place my life at your disposal and I'll go where you go and I'll lodge where you lodge and I'll walk where you would have me to walk because I believe we're living in a pivotal day. As dark as it gets, as difficult as the day is, as tepid and anemic as church culture is and we're being plowed under by the world very deeply, but Jesus is walking in our midst, making himself known and he's going to give us an option Are we going to opt in to the apostolic culture he's raising up? Are we going to continue to be invested in the way things are? Very challenging. So, Father, we opt in again today, every day, all day long. We just want to do what we see the Father do, and we want to say what you're saying. We want to be where you are. We don't want to have any missteps. We don't want to run ahead or fall behind. We just want to stay in sync with you, and by your precious gift of the Holy Spirit, We can do just that, and we can walk in wholeness. We can extend healing and life to others because we've been given life and that more abundantly. Thank you for this, and thank you for those that listen and love your word. In Jesus' name, amen.